special guest today is someone who's worked with thousands of people at hundreds of different organizations to foster creativity in the workplace. We're here today with Michelle James from the Center for Creative Emergence. Michelle, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. And so, you know, when we talk about creativity, of course, we have to set some ground rules. And I, I don't know that everybody really, um, I know I didn't until about a year ago, understand the whole left brain, right, right brain thing. So just some fundamental basics here about left brain, right brain, and then we'll, we'll move on from there. Oh, okay. So uh, for many years, a lot of people have been studying the brain, and a lot of, and a lot of researchers tend to agree that they a simple way to describe creativity is which part of the brain are you using. So for example, left brain is typically associated with analytical, numbers, organizing, linear, and the right brain is more associated with um, intuition, feeling, uh, visual thinking, nonlinear, spontaneity. And so what, when you bring creativity into an organization or you bring creativity into the development of your business, we tend to be so focused in our culture more on the left brain linear, left brain dominant culture organizations. Mm -hmm. And part of what our mission is about at our center is to help bring people bring more of the right brain types of thinking into the workplace to get better business results. Very good, very good. So the right brain is the whole creative side, and I would imagine that's where you live most of your life, in that, in that space of the right brain, yeah? Well, it's funny that you're saying that because I tend to think of both, that creativity is actually the both sides integrated. And a lot of people hmm. think the right brain is the creative. The right brain is more of the flow side. The hmm. left brain is more of the structure side, hmm. both together. It, in, in, in my framework, is what makes a, a highly creative organization or a highly creative individual. So we need really, it sounds like we really need to strike a balance. Exactly, in, the in integration. Really any any uh, type of work or any industry. Right. So when, um, when I'm, my mantra, because I'm, I do facilitated trainings and, uh, and group trainings, and so my mantra is always your people will support what they help to create. So the word create is in there. And so how do you speak to that? Your people will support what they help to create. Uh, I, I have a very similar mantra. People yeah. buy into what they help create. Oh, cool. It's exactly <laughs> right. So we're, we're on the same page with that. Uh, I think what happens, I mean, what you're speaking to really is ownership. And if you give somebody a task and say, oh, be creative about something, and they're not feeling that they've contributed to it, they're not feeling connected to it, they're not feeling they've been a part of it, it's a lot harder to generate deeper levels of creativity of thinking from somebody. But as soon as somebody has a voice in it, as soon as somebody begins to believe that they formed and shaped what we will be working on and, and what they will be creating, all of a sudden they access much deeper levels of their unconscious mind and their subconscious mind, which is a seed of a lot of where, uh, where a lot of creative ideas emerge. Mm -hmm. Now, storytelling, organizational storytelling is something that, that you teach. And we've done some shows on storytelling. And we've, we've found a way to bring in uh, storytelling with a number of our, our guests, inc including our, our most recent show, um, who was somebody who's a sales training professional. And we just talked about the power of story and, and, and sharing stories. And it really is just so powerful in, in so many levels of business. So tell us a little bit about organizational storytelling. OK. Uh well, for, first of all, as, as you even know, uh, facts are isolated and disconnected. Facts tend to be very left brain, and facts are essential. But when you weave facts into a story, it's all of a sudden you're giving context for the content. Mm. And people can better absorb information and put themselves inside the story if there's a context for it. Uh, also, I think it goes back to the place where all of us connect. You know, when you're little, you learn through stories. I mean, Ooh. our first. What we first learn is through stories. When you think about your good friends and think about your families, you remember people's stories. You might not remember the piece of data they told them unless there was some significance in a larger context. But you remember the stories. A lot of what brings us to life are our stories. And so what we, what we talk about in organizations, and, and specifically because I work a lot with creativity and innovation, is how do you use stories to help one, get buy-in, or two, j start to generate more creative ideas. Because when you begin to talk in stories, you can access a whole different set of neural pathways in the brain than you would if you were just saying, okay, here are all the facts, now let's create them. How do, how, 
allow a story to emerge. You can choose what you're going to tell a story about. You can tell a future story about uh, imagining what um, your project is going to look like when it's done and then mm. work backwards. You could tell a past story, a present mm -hmm. story. You could tell a story from a point of view of an object or another person or your customer. So storytelling all of a sudden opens up the imagination and allows you to access creativity in so many ways that pure facts and data alone are not, uh, don't do enough for. Now you've also been involved with improv for a number of years and you do something called improv based training, is that right? Right. So tell us how that well, plays oh. in, that sounds really cool and fun. So, oh sure, so um, I was already working a lot and studying a lot and working in how do I bring more creativity into organizations. And then about 14 years ago I joined an improv theater group and uh, for the la and for 10 years of that time, I was actually, we would perform uh, not far from here at the Bethesda Writer Center. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, how that played in, so I started noticing that the principles of improv, the same thing that would allow our group, we used to improvise full, full length 90 minute plays, the same oh. principles <laughs> that would allow us to improvise a play from nothing, except for two locations, we had no structure plan, planned in advance, yet, a self-organizing play would emerge that had a beginning, middle, end. A coherence would happen. The only structure you had was location. The only, were two locations two that we get from the audience. That was it. Okay. However, what we had, what our toolkit was, we had the improv principles. And the principles mm -hmm. are their rules of engagement, if yes. you will. Okay. And the principles are what allows the play to emerge. And the same principles that I was finding that were working in improv theater, I could relate and bring into organizations to help create more uh, um, co-creative teams, teams that would work more creatively together. For example, one of the principles that you probably have heard of somewhere, it's, you can Google it, it's all over, is yes and. Uh, and that's a principle that anyone in the world that does improv theater knows, and it is. So you, you can never say no in, in improv? Um, well, you, you, not at the beginning, certainly. I mean, within the larger context, sometimes there are some no's. But in general, you don't, you, you accept every offer. So yes is yes. You accept whatever offer is given. So in improv, it's looked at as your fellow improvisers are giving you a gift. It's not an intrusion when they give you an idea. You don't know what they're going to say. In so many organizations, we look at someone giving us an idea that we hadn't thought of as something like, well, that's not my agenda. In mm -hmm. improv, it's an offer. It's a gift. Mm -hmm. And you accept it, but it's not enough to say yes. It's not enough to agree. You're, you also um, offer right, up something, on something it. else, and that's the and. Oh, exactly. so you're building, building, building. Yeah, so that helps creating, keep creating, it creating. generative. It's very curvy. Uh -huh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's very cool. nonlinear. So yeah. And that, and so people will often say, well, not every idea is a good idea. Or what if you don't want to build on the idea? And so when how that transfers in working in an organization, for example, would be you allow the yes and in the divergence part of the creative process, the brainstorming part, the part where you want to generate more ideas, come up with new and novel ideas that you hadn't previously thought. Then you'll later go to the convergence part where you start to discern and let go of ideas and what doesn't work. But meanwhile, the yes and has helped expand what I call expand the creative playing field. It's helped you access novel ideas and go places you wouldn't have done if you immediately threw out an idea and I started saying, oh, well, that won't work because... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's yet almost when somebody brings an idea up and it's like, oh, we could do this, oh, we could do that, and it just keeps going up and up and up, and then later you can say, well, maybe we'll cut that and yeah. cut that, but you got to somewhere that really had a had a really impactful you know part of it. Exactly. You also you also do something called somatic centered training. Did I pronounce that right? Oh sure, um, somatic the body. Somatic, okay. Uh, so I spent five years taking a somatic. It was called core somatics, and it was a it was a training, a body work, a movement training, um, that had a hands on component, but also a movement component. And so what I discovered in there, or, or what I learned uh, that other people had been doing, was um, the, when you move the body in different ways, you begin to think differently. Mm. And the body is actually a really accessible creative resource for us. And we tend to, in our business day, tend to be, you know, walking, talking heads, right? We, we just talk all the time. 
Well, sometimes if we, part of the whole brain, bringing your whole brain to work, is also not talking for a while, letting the body wisdom kind of take over. The, if, you, if you move the body differently, or, or just even if, if I were talking to you from underneath the desk and looking up, I would see you from a different perspective. Hmm. And if we were brainstorming on something, what I saw from the perspective I was might give me a whole different ideas. If I let's try it, Michelle. Okay, right. Well, I'll just yeah, yeah. So the desk. <laughs> I would do it. <laughs> uh, and uh, and also, if you begin to get um, the body is also um, has impulses. So a lot of times, you know, when I'll tell people when they're brainstorming about something, I'll say, stand up and act it out, mm -hmm. because as you are talking about, oh, it might look like this, and and if we put this over there or added this feature in here or and then you start acting it out, all of a sudden you come with more ideas than if you weren't acting it out. So the embodiment and mm. somatics is, is a piece of whole brain training that I would definitely bring in. Very cool. You also, I read somewhere on your website, uh, something about the, the power of being present. Tell us about that. Okay. Uh, well, well, that comes back to improv. Uh, it, well, it comes back to any kind of creativity, but the power of being present is really significant in the creative process. Because if you're too busy in thinking about your plans and what you're going to do, or thinking about the past, you miss everything available to you in the present moment. And there's all kinds of great researchers, and, and Wynne Wanger, who lives in Gaithersburg around this area, um, has done a lot of work on, as well as have, have many others on, you know, what you miss from your periphery, or what you miss in the moment and how much wisdom there is um, just by being present. So if, if you begin to presence yourself, all of a sudden you're not thinking about the future where you're planning, you're not being bogged down by the past, you're becoming, you're more responsive to exactly what's happening. And you'd find, you find that you get in a more creative flow of ideas. And hmm. one of the things I love about improv-based training is it helps, it helps get you present because you can't, by, it, by its nature, you know, go into a, an agenda. You have to just mm -hmm. be adaptive, responsive, creative, and, and, and step up to add. It also allows you to step up and add your part and then to sit back and, and give space to someone else because of part of one of the other principles where you're serving the good of the scene, or, or what I call in uh, with teams and organizations, serving the whole. It actually has me think, oh. Tony, of uh, hosting this show because we have to strike a balance as interviewers between uh, being present to your answers and uh, not jumping ahead to the next the next question and thinking where is this going? How are we going to handle it? You know, because mm -hmm. it is. It, it, so there is a, a balance. And, it, and of course, in the, in the early days of doing the show, I think it was a real challenge. And it was sometimes we'd miss things. And I think as we've you know done this for a couple of years now, and gotten more comfortable with it. It's it's something that we can now be more present with our, with so. our guests. Yeah. Right, and I would imagine that it's translated into other areas of your life or work. I think where so, Where you can yeah. find yourself more present. Uh, I think you, you said a real key word in, uh, about striking a balance. Mm -hmm. So it's not just being present. It's, it's kind of a, 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 the balance between being present and being improvisational and some planning, right? Um, so in, in, in conventional strategy, it's all about strategic planning. Sit down, here's what we know, let's organize what we know and plan. Um, emergent strategy, or more of an improvisational strategy, is you have a direction, you have some things planned, but you also create more divergent space to be present for new information um, to be created right there. And then also adapt as you're, uh, as you're going along to, um, to what's really happening in the room, or in the world, or, or uh, as you're putting out your product or service into the world. You're adapting it so it doesn't become fixed. It doesn't become, here we have, and it's, it, people are accepting it or rejecting it. It's, oh, people seem to like this aspect. We might need to mo refine or modify this aspect of our product. And so it's this continual feedback loop that allows you to plan and improvise, plan and improvise. Very good. See, what's interesting is she's just grabbing the restaurant business every day. <laughs> uh, yeah. There's a lot of fancy terminology for the restaurant business. <laughs> right. Seriously, you know, we're constantly looking at what's going on and what feedback is immediately. And since we're, a, you know, a one cohesive unit that 
produces and sells and collects payment and does the marketing and all that. It's the same, it's the same mm. thing. You know, I think you're... I already, yeah. I already, I already got this whole thing. Yeah, you got that down <laughs> pat. <laughs> got it down. So uh, we're going to go to break, but what I want to ask you when we come back is... Um, how to get unstuck, because we all get stuck from time to time. I mean, I, I would imagine everybody on this planet deals with feeling stuck at some point in business or, or personally, and, and, and so we want to talk about some simple ways to get unstuck. Sounds great. All right. You're watching We Mean Business. We'll be back in seconds. Hey. Ready to go? Yeah, but the uh, fire's not out. It's close enough. Huh. Close enough? If it's too hot to touch, it's too hot to leave. I mean, the next thing you know, you've torched our whole neighborhood. Which is why we're not going anywhere? Exactly. Nine out of ten wildfires are caused by humans. Only you can prevent wildfires. Welcome back to We Mean Business. We're here today with Michelle James from the Center for Creative Emergence. So, Michelle, you know, this thing about getting stuck, we, we've all been there. We've all felt that way. What's just a simple step that we can all take to get or feel unstuck? Okay, so um, a simple step is any kind of pattern breaking. Mm. So do something to break your pattern. Uh, so for me, sometimes it might be, um, you know, if I'm, I might start writing with my opposite hand. Uh, mm. Because all of a sudden I get to a different part of my brain. I might, I often, what I often do is I start drawing the concepts then I get to a different part of the brain if I'm working on something and I feel stuck. Uh, I put music on, maybe I start dancing, maybe I just start moving around. Um, you know, it could be anything simple from breaking a pattern to going for a walk or a hike or using a creative process to break a pattern. Mm -hmm. Just one thing to also speak, talk to about stuckness is that it is an actual very normal part of the creative process. Mm -hmm. um, it's akin, a, a lot of times it comes from resistance sometimes. So there's a slight difference, like being stuck, but being resistant, sometimes natural resistance shows up, and that's an actual part of the creative process. Uh, like an unconscious resistance? Yeah, well, and, and, and if you think about it in nature, when every, anything, the flower, or, or say like a chick feels the shell of the egg, the most right before it's going to be born, right before you're going to have a breakthrough idea, or right before mm. something new is going to happen. You feel the resistance of everything that kept, that maintained the status quo. But in unlike nature, people will feel that resistance and they often shut down or turn around. But like with nature, the chick will keep, you know, pecking through the egg and it actually strengthens the beak and then it's like born into this new world. I feel the same way as when we are creative ideas. What usually happens in all of us, and that's why I call it natural resistance, is there's an actual natural part of us. We have this dynamic tension always between a part of us that wants to maintain the status quo and a part of us that wants to create something new. And so just acknowledging that is, um, is this really a wrong path or is this natural resistance? You know, am I stuck or is this natural resistance? Sometimes just mm. acknowledging it loosens the hold. And then you can say, you know what, I'm going to keep working on it any anyway. So it's just something to be aware of that. Um, you know, be gentle with yourself and with other people if you or your team are going through some natural resistance because that does happen. It does show up in some different ways for different people. Mm -hmm. hmm. So tell me, when we look at a more macro level of like an industry, let's say, like maybe the restaurant industry or certain uh, larger you know, uh, systems, how do we start to change the the mindset behind being so linear to more of a creative style? You know, that is a great question uh, when you talk about, like, how do we change a mindset? How do we change a right. paradigm, which is larger than just the group in the room? Right. Uh, and I, I, I can't say I know all of the ways. One way that I try to do it is um, rather than just talk about it, and go out and say, okay, everyone, here's the creativity-centered mindset, and here's what you need to embrace. I think there are people that are really effective at it. How I try to do it is I try to do it locally where I am. So one way I'm doing it is through you know, putting on a creativity and business conference and getting a bunch of people who are very credible at bringing creativity in their organizations to uh, show people how to do it. I think the way... You know, people buy into what they help create, but they also buy into what they experience. Mm -hmm. And so you give people an experience of it. Uh, so I think 
be, thankfully, I mean, um, what I'm doing, there are so many people now, there are so many people doing work on bringing creativity into organizations, and people are doing it so many different ways, so I think it's already happening on one level. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions I always ask myself, and I, I ask my clients too, around when you're very um, mission-centered, like I am, you know, I'm in this mission to bring this, like, right brain creative thinking into the, into the or, or business world. Uh, you know, I always ask um, a question and, and sit with as sort of my own daily mantra, you know, what's mine to do, no more, no less, to serve this? You know, given that I am one person, what's mine to do? And then, uh, you know, some of it's a trust that it's also happening. You know, all you have to do is get on Twitter and get on Facebook and get on social media and you'll see the difference between now and how many creativity groups are coming up and how mm -hmm. many... So there's, it's, I, I think it's a both and. Do what's yours to do, and then also trust that you know, change is happening. But what can you do in your industry, be an example, and then others will look at and go, oh, wow, look at how they're running their restaurant. How mm -hmm. do we do that? I, it feels like you know, the technology companies are naturally born with this young, creative mindset of like just you know, throw ideas and see what sticks, and, and not that you know, linear thing. But do you, do you find organizations that you almost can find the layers, like the oil in the water, and you kind of see the old school mindset and the new school, and you're, you have to kind of manage the two of them. And how do you do that? Yeah, well, uh, right. So that's, <laughs> a, that's <laughs> easy topic. <laughs> you right? got more than 10 minutes? Yeah. Right. Well, I, I will say, first, so first of all, to your point, you know, there's a very, we're noticing a lot of difference in generational creativity. Right. Um, because those, you know, of us grew up, when we were, when I was younger, we weren't playing on the internet. This, these new breeds of, you know, millennials are. So, ha first of all, you really honor and recognize and acknowledge and value each of the generations and, ha and how they create. And creative diversity and creative styles is really important to honor and not to try to make everyone the same, but use the differences. Uh, so, so I think that would be, you know, the first thing. And the second thing is how do you do it, you know, I, I don't know that there's one easy answer for every kind of organization. I think, so for, for me at this point, I do a lot of upfront um, uh, interviewing with a company to even see, because I, I don't, I learned the hard way that I'd rather not work with organizations that they say we just want to be creative, but then it mm. keeps a, bo a boxed in. Yeah. Because real creativity, if you really unleash creativity in a system, it will bring change. And it's going to be uncomfortable some, for some people. So I think the first, it, first is make sure whether it's an individual entrepreneur organization or your work team that people are really committed to it. And then half the answers are going to emerge over time. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the beauty, what I believe in so deeply in the creative process and the emergence piece is that you just do what you do with what knowledge you have and trust that if you're engaging something, with the, if you have an intention, you're connected to your mission, and you believe in creative process, things will emerge you can't possibly know now over time as you engage it. Yeah, it seems like something that, you know, like you said, you talked about the principles and not being so, you know, formulated. I think if you're creative and you create that environment and that culture, things will constantly come out that are great ideas and, and uh, you know, variations on great ideas. And I think, like, the old mindset was kind of like you have a meeting and then it's like there's a stopping point and then you have another meeting in three months or whatever. And I always found that some, so many of those meetings... There's such a, we want to be, you know, we want to listen to you, want to ask for your opinion, but really the culture isn't supporting that, and everybody knows it. Right. Everybody kind of gives each other the elbow and says, yeah, they want to ask, you know, and you're like the one head that sticks up that gets cut off. So I see that as such a change where really the whole, you know, all the generations and all the, whether it's age or whatever, um, have to buy into this idea to really say, okay, you can put out a bad idea, you know, or, 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 or an idea that may fail, and we talked about failure earlier. That you know, do you want to speak a little bit on the idea of failing? Yeah, and I think it's really important when if you tell people that you want to be a ri you want them to take do risk taking, right. that you don't make it a risk averse culture. Right. That you make it a risk supportive culture, right. uh, because all pioneering, all new ideas, all creativity, innovation you know, happens iteratively. It happens through trial and error. You, you start walking down one path and then you find out it was a dead end and you have to switch and turn. Um, if you start to judge and evaluate your failure along the way, uh, you, see it, you see a wrong, a dead end as a failure, you shut down, you freeze. Um, I think we need to really, when we talk about creativity more than anything, get out of the binary pass-fail mentality that we've all been socialized with in our educational system. 
and really get into more of an exploratory mode where a dead end is part of the exploration and it can often, like an improv, sometimes a, a flop is the invitation to create something new. It, throughout history, if you read the history of a lot of inventors and creators, it was the thing that the unexpected, the thing that they weren't looking at, that um, allowed them to create some sort of invention. So it's a really important to be a risk friendly. And uh, just to your point about meetings, I know with one uh, national client I have whose corporate headquarters are here, they, were, they would go through these meetings, roll their eyes, dreaded oh, them, felt nothing ever got done, had a lot of resentment. And so we work to, use, to develop a set of um, creativity principles that they bring in, now use every meeting. They use a whole brain, um, a whole brain kind of warm-up technique to start, and now they call their meetings discovery sessions so instead of meetings. So built into the meeting is the idea that we're also going to have a divergent time to discover and then the convergent time to get things done. So, so starting from the very beginning, I think as children are naturally creative and naturally excited and they don't filter much, which is, you know, always an interesting situation. <laughs> but, you know, where do we start to, I mean, do you feel like now kids are growing up in a different environment that encourages more right brain thinking? Or do, how do we, you know, where, where do we start to lose and get confined into that, you know, I shouldn't say anything. Or I should steam, steam my cubicle and do my thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah how right, does that? Right. I mean, how has it started? And do you see it changing? And do you think that that'll be an old topic in 50 years, where we even have this discussion about, you know, about the old the old school mentality? Uh, I'm I'm hoping. My I mean, my my hope, my deepest hope, and what I'm working toward is that it will become an old topic, right. and we'll look back and go, guys, remember those days those where everything, times. yeah, those prehistoric <laughs> times where <laughs> we were just like on valuing left brain dominant only, mm -hmm. and we were putting that. Uh, above the right brain, whereas in, in reality they find that if you use more right brain techniques, first of all you build a better um, uh, creative playing field, you get more ideas, then you bring the left brain in to organize something around it. We just go right into organizing. So to answer your question about the, the kids in schools, I see two, two things happening and I remain hopeful because I believe that in sort of the benevolent nature of, you know, that we're, we're just evolving and things are, are on a positive upswing. However, I think in the schools that we see that they've taken out recess or they've taken out the arts classes, that I think is devastating. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to, uh, because, because the, that's going to be harder for that person to be in an adaptive, flexible, flowing environment when they get older in the, work, um, in the workforce. On the other hand, what I see more of is because of the internet, because of more people waking up to and valuing creativity, because of all the books now out there, the availability, you know, Dan Pink's book, Whole mm -hmm. New Mind, um, all kinds of books out there talking about right brain thinking, talking about whole brain thinking, I think, and, and more and more educators valuing that, I think um, we're starting to see a shift where more people, people are really honoring more like, let's, follow the child's creative process instead of just impose all these answers and just make them right or wrong, good or bad, you know, them reciting back to us what we give them, let's also engage them and so we can engage our creativity. And I think then we're going to see a huge transformation in the workplace. Mm. Great note to end on, Michelle. Our time is up. Thank you so much for, for being with us today. Thank and you. We and we want our viewers to know you can find out more about Michelle James, the Center for Creative Emergence, and... Um, I've attended one of Michelle's workshops. She's always putting on amazing workshops. She's got one coming up here real soon. Visit WeMeanBiz.tv to find out more. You've been watching We Mean Business. I'm Steve Dorfman. For myself and Tony Marchanti, thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you next time.